This morning we're in uh, Mark 14. We're quickly coming to the end of this uh, particular gospel. I think I have enjoyed our times in the gospels more than just about anything else. I almost feel like picking up another gospel. I think there's two that I still haven't gone through. And as you know, each of the gospels has different events recorded. Sometimes they overlap. Sometimes they don't. Each is unique. Uh, so there's always plenty to learn from them. But uh, this morning we're in Mark chapter 14. We're going to be looking at uh, verses 66 through 72. And that is the account of Peter's denying of his Lord uh, the three times. And we just want to look at this and remember from this that Christians are obviously not perfect. Christians do sin. And on this side of glory, we're not going to become perfect, though we wish we could. It just isn't going to happen, notwithstanding those churches that believe that it can happen, and it actually has happened in some of their lives. Uh, it doesn't happen. And if we ever come to think that in this life we've achieved perfection, uh, we are far from the truth in that regard. We cannot see our own sins. But let's read about Peter now and from Mark 14, verses 66 through 72. And remember that Peter was the one who said, Even though all deny you, Lord, I never will. Verse 66, As Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came. And seeing Peter warming himself, she looked at him and said, You also were with Jesus the Nazarene. But he denied it, saying, I neither know nor understand what you are talking about. And he went out onto the porch. The servant girl saw him, began once more to say to the bystanders, This is one of them. But again he denied it. And after a little while, the bystanders were again saying to Peter, Surely you are one of them, for you are a Galilean too. But he began to curse and swear. I do not know this man you are talking about. Immediately, a rooster crowed a second time. And Peter remembered how Jesus had made the remark to him. Before a rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. And he began to weep. May the Lord bless his word again to our hearing this morning. Now, you'll recall that last time we saw Jesus arrested and brought to the court of the high priest for one reason only, and that is that he might be condemned. There was, you know, it was not to find out whether Jesus was guilty or innocent. It was only to try to find some way to find him guilty. Now, remember that what Jesus was doing there was taking our place. He does so not only in the cross or on the cross in the court of God's justice when our sins were imputed to him and he died for them, but he also took our place in man's court that he might set us free not just from the guilt of sin but also from any temporal punishment that might be due to us for our sins for the crimes we've committed in this world and against God every sin we commit is against God some of them are against others we call those perhaps crimes but the reason why I repeat that is because what we saw last Lord's Day evening when a believer dies, he doesn't have to go to purgatory in order to satisfy for uh, the temporal punishments due to his sins because Jesus didn't do it all. No, it's all taken care of. Jesus did it all. And of course, this morning we see the results of this mercy in the forgiveness of Peter, the cleansing of his guilt, and of course, any temporal punishment that might have been due to him, although in this case I don't think Peter committed a crime against any man. He certainly did against the Lord, yet the Lord was merciful. Now we've seen that Jesus standing in our place, taking our place, his sacrifice for us calls us as his people to take a stand for him. But what happens when we fail to do this? What happens when we know that we're supposed to do this but we find ourselves unable to do it or unwilling and we sin against him when we fail to stand up for the Lord. Is the Lord going to condemn us? Is the Lord going to cast us away forever if we go too far? Well, no. The Lord says that he won't because he won't let you go too far if you are a believer. The Bible says that God will grant you repentance based upon, of course, 
the mediation, the intercession, the prayers of our Lord Jesus Christ who intercedes in heaven. He will grant you repentance. And when you repent, He will forgive you. Jesus will not lose any of His sheep, any whom the Father has given Him. Now we see this put to the test in the life of Peter this morning. You'll remember that Jesus told His disciples that they would all fall away. The shepherd would be struck and the sheep would be scattered. He would be arrested. They would all desert Him. And of course, you remember, they all objected. We will die before we will ever do that, they told Jesus earlier. And Peter, in an even greater display of pride, said, even though all may fall away, and I think he was referring to the other disciples, yet I will not. I will stand with you, Lord. I am willing even to die with you. But what happened? When Jesus was arrested, they did exactly what he said they would do. None stood with him. None went off with him to die. They all fled. And what about Peter? Did he turn out to be the exception as he had hoped that he would? No. He ran away with them. Now, we see that he did even more than that. He fell even further. You know how the scripture said pride comes before a fall. Peter was the proudest of them all. Lord, I will never deny you. I'll go to death with you. He's the one who fell the furthest from the Lord because... He was trusting in his own strength and not in the Lord's. Well, afterwards we read that he followed Jesus, but he followed him in a distance, still not wanting to identify himself with him, into the court of the high priest. And he sat with the officers as though he was with them. And he was warming himself with them by the fire while Jesus was on trial. But what Peter feared might happen, which is why he was trying to distance himself from Jesus, actually did happen. Somebody recognized him. And it was just one of the servant girls of the high priest. And she said, you also were with Jesus the Nazarene. Well, here was Peter's chance to amend, to repent, and to stand up for his Lord, to do what he should have done in the first place to be willing even to die with Jesus rather than deny him. But did he do that, given another opportunity? No. He says in verse 68, I neither know nor understand what you are talking about. He not only ran away with the disciples, but given the opportunity again to stand up for Jesus, he denies him. Well, then Peter tries to get away from her. He walks out onto the porch, and at once he hears the rooster crow. Now again, the servant girl sees him and tries to expose him. This is one of them. Again, he had the opportunity to repent and stand up for Jesus, but again, he denies it. And then finally, a little bit later, those standing around realized that he was a Galilean. And Mark doesn't tell us why, but I believe it's in Matthew's gospel. They hear him speak, and they hear him speaking as a Galilean would speak. You know, they had accents from different areas, or perhaps the way they spoke was a little bit different. So they heard him and they said to him, surely you are one of them, for you too, or you are a Galilean too. Now at this point, Peter knew that he had to choose one way or the other. You know, he either had to more strongly deny Jesus or stand up for him, but again he denies the Lord and he does it in the most, what you might say, the strongest possible way. He began to curse and swear. Now I know we often read that. And we think that Jesus, or not Jesus, of course, but Peter, started using foul language. But that's not what he was doing here. That's not what this means. What it means is he swore an oath and he called a curse down on himself, which was the strongest possible way of denying something that was known in this culture. If what he said wasn't the absolute truth, may I be cursed, he says, I do not know this man you are talking about. Well, immediately... The rooster crows a second time, and Peter remembered what Jesus said. Before a rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. And Peter began to weep because he realized that he had done the very thing he had promised his Lord he would never do. He denied him not just one time. He didn't just run away with the rest of the disciples, but when faced with the opportunity again to do what was right, he denied him three times. Now, is it possible for a true believer, one who really loves the Lord Jesus Christ, to sin against the Lord like this? Well, you might be surprised 
what the Bible says you are capable of doing. A Christian can do almost everything that an unbeliever can do. But now what will the Lord do to you if you sin? Will the Lord disown you? Will he cast you out of his family? You're no longer a Christian, you're no longer saved, and you have to be saved again. Well, no, the Bible doesn't really teach that. The Bible teaches that the Lord will grant to you repentance. He will turn your heart around back to him, and when you repent, he will forgive you. Now, I, I think you know as well as I do that the example of Peter has, is one of the classic illustrations of that very thing, the other one being David. We, saw in, we, we sang it in, in Psalm 51. David committed adultery and murder, and yet the Lord forgave him. The Lord not only forgave him, but he turned him from that direction, brought him back to himself. David repented and was forgiven. Peter did the same thing. Peter and David, although this morning we're looking at Peter, is a classic illustration of the wonderful gospel truth that no one is able to snatch you out of Jesus' hand or out of the Father's hand. No one can take you away, and you really cannot, because you do not want to, you can't not forsake him fully and finally. Now this morning I want to take this and go a couple different directions with it which are, of course, related. The first thing I want us to look at is this, that being a Christian does not mean that you're perfect. You can still sin. Now, I only say that because I want you to see that, that falling into sin is not inconsistent with being a Christian. There are some people who actually believe that. And we're going to look at uh, one in particular who believes that you can actually reach sinless perfection in this life. The Bible says that can't happen. One day you will be perfect, but that will be in heaven if you trust Jesus. But the second thing I want us to look at is this, that even when you do fall into sin, the Lord is not going to condemn you. He's not going to throw you out of his family, but in his love he is going to grant you repentance. He is going to grant you forgiveness when you repent. So first of all, let's consider that as a Christian you're not perfect, that you still sin. Now, that may come as a revelation to some of you. I hope not, because the Bible tells us quite plainly that is our condition. This is true of every believer. And why do I even need to talk about it? Well, I've already told you it's because there are those who believe that actually there are those, we might even say cults, because they wouldn't even fall within the realm of Christianity, who believe that the mark of your being a Christian is the fact that you no longer sin but that you actually become perfect. We're not going to deal with those, but we are going to deal with those who actually believe that you can become perfect. Uh, in this life, while you're still on earth, you can experience what we might call a second blessing of the Holy Spirit and become entirely sanctified so that you no longer sin. We need to see that this is not the case in Scripture. Now, who is it that might believe something like that? Well, oddly enough, one of those... Um, uh, evangelists who lived during the time of the Great Awakening that we looked at, uh, it was, might have been last year or the year before, John Wesley. He believed uh, in what was called the second blessing. Those who were influenced by his thinking uh, are also affected by this. Uh, those who are in what is called the, the holiness movement, and I do need to be careful here because the Lord calls us to be holy. We ought to be striving to become like Jesus Christ. We are, uh, we might say, pietists in a certain way. We believe that we ought to live a life like Jesus Christ, consecrated to God. That it's not only uh, something God calls us to do, but something that in some measure we can do by the grace that God supplies. But we do want to distance ourselves from those who believe that you can become entirely sanctified in this life that is, you can have all the corruption in your heart actually removed. Now, who is it that believes that? Well, again, those who are influenced by the holiness movement, um, a couple of groups, there are some Pentecostal groups, not all of them, of course. The Church of the Nazarene, certainly. Now, they don't believe that every Christian becomes perfect, but they do believe it's possible to become perfect. And I think it would be good for us to understand that that is not what the Bible teaches. Now, let me give you an example from the Church of the Nazarene. Do they really believe that a person, a Christian, can become perfect in this life, have 
all of their sin removed, not just guilt, but corruption out of their hearts so that they no longer sin. As a matter of fact, they do. In their Articles of Faith, chapter 10, try to follow along. This, this isn't the clearest statement I've ever seen, but we'll try to break it down just a bit. This is what they say, quote, We believe that entire sanctification is that act of God subsequent or that comes after regeneration, which is the new birth, by which he transforms believers into the likeness of Christ. It is wrought by God's grace through the Holy Spirit in initial sanctification, I think that's when you first are saved, or regeneration, simultaneous with justification, entire sanctification, and the continued perfecting work of the Holy Spirit culminating in glorification. In glorification, we are fully conformed to the image of the Son. Well, we would agree with that part. We believe that entire sanctification is that act of God subsequent or after regeneration by which believers are made free from original sin or depravity and brought into a state of entire uh, devotement to God and the holy obedience of love made perfect. Boy, I wish this were true, but it isn't true. But this is what they believe. Okay. It is wrought by the baptism with or infilling of the Holy Spirit and comprehends in one experience the cleansing of the heart from sin and the abiding, indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit empowering the believer for life and service. Certainly we believe in the power of the Holy Spirit to serve the Lord, just not to this degree. Entire sanctification is provided by the blood of Jesus, is wrought instantaneously by grace through faith, preceded by entire consecration. And to this work and state of grace, the Holy Spirit bears witness. Okay, so what does this say? Christian perfection is possible. It's something that comes after regeneration or after you have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. They believe it is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, we believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but we don't see it as a second experience. We see it as that experience which actually places you in Christ that enables you to believe in the first place, that which regenerates you. But they see it as the baptism of the Spirit. They believe that it frees you from original sin, from that depravity or corruption of nature, that thing that we have to fight against as Christians, enabling you to devote yourself entirely to God. It's accomplished instantly by the Holy Spirit, but is preceded, they say, by entire con consecration. From that, I can only assume they mean that you give yourself entirely to the Lord, and if you're willing to do that, the Lord will consecrate you or he will grant you that entire sanctification. Now, oddly enough, in their view, this perfection, the removal of this, this corruption of my heart, doesn't protect you from sinning. I mean, it, it gives you the ability not to sin, but you can still sin. It returns you to that state, they say, that Adam was in in the garden, who had, again, no corruption of heart, but still was able to sin. We know that because he actually did choose to sin. So it returns us to the state Adam was in where you can do what is right, you can do it perfectly, but you can still fall away from the Lord. And in their view, they believe that a, that a believer can reach this perfection and then fall entirely away from the Lord even as Adam did, and perish in hell forever, which I don't believe Adam did. And they state this in Article 7 of their Articles of Faith. This is what they say, quote, We believe that all persons, though in the possession of the experience of regeneration and entire sanctification, may fall from grace and apostatize and, unless they repent of their sins, be hopelessly and eternally lost. Okay, so you can become perfect, but you can fall from that perfection and end up in hell. Now, what that tells us is, of course, they believe, like most uh, what we call Arminians, that you, you know, it's your choice that brings you in, it's your choice that takes you out. It's not really God's choice that brings you in, and it's not God who keeps you. You basically have to work with God to be kept, and if you don't, you fall and you can lose your salvation. But let's focus in on the one aspect now of entire sanctification. Why would they believe such a thing is possible? Well, here's some of the passages they look at. 1 John 1, 
verses 7 and 9, passing over the very important verse 8, but let's, this is what they quote. If we believe, or excuse me, if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus his son cleanses us from all sin. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Okay, keying in on the cleansing from all unrighteousness. 1 John 4, verses 17 and 18. By this, love is perfected with us so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment because as he is, so also are we in the world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves punishment. And the one who fears is not perfected in love. The implication is that one may become perfect in his love. 1 John 3, 3. And everyone who has this hope fixed on him purifies himself just as he is pure. The belief is that one might become as pure as Jesus is pure. Now, obviously, in one sermon, we're not going to be able to deal with everything that could be said. We don't have time to scrutinize these passages except to say this that they're confusing what we are in Christ with regard to our guilt versus what we can be practically in our lives as we seek to live for God's glory. They miss passages that tell us that we can't become perfect in this life, such as verse 8 of 1 John 1. If we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. You see, if, if if the total cleansing of corruption and guilt is possible, and I believe what John means here by sin is that corruption. Sometimes sin refers to individual uh, breakings of God's law, but sometimes it refers to that corrupt principle in our hearts, and I don't think they can make that distinction. But John says here, if we say we have no sin, in this case, if we have no, no, no corruption in our hearts that breaks out in various acts of sin, Far from being a Christian, he says we're deceiving ourselves and the truth isn't even in us because if we knew the truth about ourselves, we would realize that, that what, what the Bible says about us is we are far from perfect. Paul tells us this in Galatians 5.17 and he is talking to Christians. For the flesh sets its desire against the spirit. And the spirit against the flesh, for these are in opposition to one another so that you may not do the things that you please. Now, they would say that this must apply only to those who aren't entirely sanctified, but Paul doesn't make that distinction. He says this is the experience of every believer. You have a war going on in your heart for what is right and what is wrong. If that weren't the case, walking with Jesus would be a walk in the park, wouldn't it? Be so easy. I mean, if that were true, let's, you know, let's pray, God, give us this entire sanctification. Shut off the flesh. Let me just live in the Spirit and be perfect like Adam was perfect, and I'll serve you perfectly. But it doesn't happen because that's not the way the Lord has made it. Paul tells us in Romans 8, 13, speaking again to true believers of something you must do if you're going to find life ultimately. If you are living according to the flesh, he says, you must die. But if by the Spirit you are putting to, to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Again, speaking of that warfare, speaking of that struggle, and the fact that we must be engaged in it. If we give ourselves over to our corrupt desires, we'll die, he says, because you're not converted. But if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the flesh, not that you put them to death, if that's possible, but you need to fight against them, you need to war against them, you need to be putting them to death, and if you do, you will live. That is the work of the Spirit of God fighting against the flesh, seeking to make you more like Jesus Christ. Now, what does that mean for us? It means in the context of what we've been looking at that even though we are all called to make a stand for the Lord, to shine His lights in the world, to stand for Christ as He stood for us, and to be a means of other salvation, even though that's what we're called to do, sometimes we're going to fail. Maybe we're going to fail often. We're not going to be able to do it perfectly. But it also means that, as Peter shows us in his example, that even though we can go to the point of denying the Lord Jesus Christ, 
that God is not going to cast us away, that still we cannot be perfect. Now, let me just say this, because the tendency of our flesh, of our sinful corruption, would be to do this. Take this principle and run with it. I can't be perfect, so why try? I can't be perfect, but God's still going to forgive me. So why don't we sin more that grace may abound? If you ever use Peter's example of the fact that it's possible for you as a believer to fall even into the worst of sins and that you can come back, if you ever use that as an example or as an excuse to sin, you're not using it for the reason why the Lord put it here in the first place. This should never be used as an excuse for sin, but it should be used for a couple of different things. To make sense of our own experience because we still sin. Why do I still sin? I love the Lord. He's given me His Holy Spirit. I, I, I'm seeking to be filled with the Spirit. Why do I still struggle with sin? Well, it's because Christians struggle with sin. That's the way it is. It helps us make sense of our own experience. That's how we should use it. But secondly, we should use it in this way. To comfort ourselves and to comfort others when we actually do fall into sin. Because sin is still a very real possibility. Uh, it's a reality for the Christian. Sadly, after we're converted to Christ, we're still human beings. And so we're still capable of doing just about anything that any human being can do, even an unbeliever. The one exception is that we cannot deny the Lord Jesus Christ with our whole heart and fall away from Him. You know that Peter, when he denied Jesus, he wasn't saying, now's my opportunity to distance myself from Jesus. He was struggling in his heart. I want to stand up for him. I want to confess him the way that I, that I said I would. But if I do, they're going to take me and put me on trial. They're going to put me to death too, and I don't want to die. Uh, there was a real struggle there. See, the unbeliever will just simply say, hey, I don't know Jesus Christ. Be like Judas, and, and I'm out of here, you know, and I walk away from Jesus, and that's it. The unbeliever will fall entirely away from the Lord, but for the believer, even when he's sinning, there is going to be this struggle. You cannot sin against the Lord with your whole heart. Even though you may give in to that corruption that in your flesh and it may win over at that point, you will come back and you will not be able to do it, as I've said, in, you know, wholeheartedly because you love the Lord. You've probably heard this expression before, but being a Christian doesn't mean you're perfect. It just means you're forgiven. But it's more than that, obviously, because the Lord is working in us to make us more like Jesus, even through our falls. We're going to see that in just a moment. But there is mercy. There is grace. There is forgiveness at the throne of grace if you're trusting the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Don't use this as an, ex as an excuse for your sin, but on the other hand, realize that when you sin, that doesn't mean you're not a believer because believers sin. Also, don't forget perfection, though we might like it to be real, is not a possibility. We will still sin as long as we're in this world, and if you ever think that you've reached the point where you're sinless, then you may not even know the Lord because that is not a possibility. If we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But again, let's get to this idea of forgiveness, that encouragement that is here. Even when you do sin, God's not going to condemn you. He's not going to throw you out of His family. He is going to bring you to repentance. And when you repent, He is going to forgive you. Now, you need to realize that when God saved you, everything that you had done in the past, everything you were doing in the present, and everything you would do in the future was not a surprise to Him. It's, he sees it all as though it were just one point in time. I mean, he sees everything. He knows all that you're going to do, every sin that you would ever commit. And every, not only just every sin you've ever committed, but every one that you would commit. Remember what Jesus said to Peter. Jesus knew Peter was going to deny him three times. Jesus told Peter that he was going to deny him three times. But when Jesus told Peter this, again, knowing the future, knowing what Peter was going to do, he didn't say, Peter, I know you're going to deny me. And when you do, you're out, buddy. That's it. Okay, you're no longer a part of the, of the clan, of the household. Maybe if you repent, I'll bring you back. But sorry, that's it. No, that's not what Jesus told Peter. 
And what we need to see is that what Jesus told Peter is not something that applied only to Peter. I believe it's something that applies to all of us. He said this, Satan has desired to sift you like wheat. You will deny me three times, but I have prayed for you. And when you turn again, which means when you repent, strengthen the brethren. Now what this tells us is that Jesus, is inter he intercedes for us, is what the Bible says. He's in heaven praying for us right now. But do you realize that Jesus, from this example, even prays before we commit sins. He prays knowing we're going to commit sins. He intercedes for us before we commit sins that the Father might grant repentance to us. That's what he was praying for Peter. Peter, when you turn again, it's not if you turn again, but when you turn again because he says, I pray for you. The Father hears the prayers of his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. He answers those prayers. The Bible says if you trust in Jesus, he is praying for you in heaven. He is, he's not praying that you'll be lost. He's praying that you'll be saved. He's not praying the Father would cast you away, but that he would keep you and that no one would be able to take you out of his hand, that he might secure you. Now, Jesus' prayers through all of the difficulties we face in life not only result in our repentance and in our forgiveness, but we would also say it, it re results in our strengthening, in our growing more, interestingly enough, into the image of Christ. When we sin and are recovered, we don't become less like him. We actually become more like him. Jesus said to Peter, when you turn, strengthen the brethren which means not only that he was going to turn around and repent because of Jesus' intercession, but that he was also going to be used by the Lord to minister to the brethren, perhaps even better than he was able to before, drawing on his own experiences of God's mercy and grace to encourage them as well. And that's exactly what Peter did. And here's another interesting point. Jesus even forgives premeditated sins. Sometimes we're tempted to think, and, and maybe all of us haven't gone through this, but there's this, this the few verses in the Old Testament that talk about presumptuous sin, that there's no forgiveness or there's no atonement or there's no sacrifice for a presumptuous sin, which almost sounds like it's saying, if you know something is wrong and you still do it and you do it, that's it, you're lost. And I know that I struggled with that at one time, and I know others who have struggled with that at some time, but I want you to look at this example. This was premeditated sin. And the Lord still forgave it. Peter knew that to deny Jesus Christ was sin. That's why he objected in, the midst, you know, in, in such strong terms to Jesus. Everyone might fall away from you, but I won't. I will even die with you, Lord. Well, he knew it was sin. And he told the Lord that, that he would die with him before he would ever commit that sin. Well, Jesus told him that he was going to commit that sin. And when he finally committed that sin, he committed it not just, actually not even just three times. He, he ran away from the Lord. That's one denial. And then he denies him the three times. So there's actually four times altogether. The third time in front of these people, he even swears that he does not know him, calling down a curse on himself if what he said wasn't true. Now let me ask you, can, can, could anyone possibly sin in a more premeditated and, you know, uh, absolute way than that. How could you have sinned more openly and yet the Lord forgave him? The Lord granted him repentance. Peter repented as seen in his weeping. He wept like the woman who had been forgiven, wept. Although she was weeping, of course, with happiness and forgiveness, Peter was weeping over his sins, but his heart was breaking because of what he had done to his Lord. And did Peter repent? He did exactly what his Lord had prayed that he would. He turned and he began to follow the Lord as he should. Now, you realize, of course, that there was a greater power the Lord was going to give to his people on the day of Pentecost. And we see Peter as he's emboldened by the Holy Spirit more on that day. We do see that there is a difference. But we also see that same Peter a little while later beginning to distance himself from the Gentiles and eat only with the Jews. And Paul has to come and Rebuke him to his face. Peter hadn't become perfect. And even with the Holy Spirit, he still sinned. But the point is, we are going to sin, but there is forgiveness. 
Now again, this, this isn't a work that we have to do, repenting in order for the Lord to forgive us. This is a work that God does in us. This is something He will do for us if we are trusting in Him. And so if you ask yourself the question, will the Lord forgive my sins? Will He forgive you even when you do something you know is wrong? I mean, you read His Word, you're seeking to serve Him, the opportunity comes to do something for the Lord, or maybe it's a temptation to some other sin. You fall into that sin, you don't take a stand for the Lord. Even if you knew it was wrong to do that ahead of time, you still do it. Will the Lord forgive you? Well, the Bible says that there is forgiveness for all of your sins in Jesus Christ. Jesus didn't die for just some of your sins. He died for all of your sins. The Bible says that He will not reject you even when you do sin if you've trusted in Him. You never need to be afraid that the Lord will reject you when you've done the things you know that He does not want you to do. The Bible says He loves you so much that He will never lose you. He will never let go of you. If you are trusting in Him, He will not give you up. Now that is a tremendous encouragement, isn't it? Because if we haven't already blown it in many ways, we certainly will before we get out of this world. We will blow it. We will sin. And we will do it knowing that what we are doing is sinful. Again, don't use that as an excuse, but realize it's going to happen. But there is forgiveness. If you are a true believer, the Lord will move in your heart to turn you around, to bring you back to Himself, to confess your sins, and He will forgive you. Now lastly, I do want those of you who are here this morning who haven't trusted the Lord, you haven't, you know, maybe you haven't believed on Him or maybe you haven't publicly professed Him. You need to know that this is true for all who will put their trust in Jesus Christ. Uh, the door isn't closed to heaven. Jesus is still the door. The door is still open for all who will come to Him. If you will simply trust in the Lord, you need to realize that He stands ready and willing to forgive you. The Bible says quite plainly that the one who comes to Him, He will not cast out. He will receive all that will come to Him. And if you will come to Him, He will do this for you. But you do need to do what I told you. Again, there are those who believe you don't, but certainly the Bible says you must repent of your sins. You have to be willing to turn around from your way of doing things that's contrary to God's will. You need to actually, Jesus says, be willing to give up all that you have, your life. You need to pick up your cross, follow Him. You need to be willing to give up all your possessions, not in the sense that you actually part with them unless the Lord calls you to do that for some reason, but you need to see yourself and all that you have is His. And Jesus actually says on one occasion, you must be willing to part with all these things. You must, no one can be my disciple unless he's willing to give up all his possessions. You have to give all that you are, everything that you have to Jesus Christ. You need to see yourself as a steward over what belongs to Him. Okay? Your life, your marriage, your, your children, your house, everything. And you need to be Christ-centered. This isn't something you do and it's like my fire insurance policy that I put in my back pocket. I prayed, I'm saved, but I can live my life the way I want to live and do what I want to do. That is not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that the Lord came into the world to call us to turn from living for ourselves, to seeking after our own pleasure and our own glory, to begin to live for His pleasure and for His glory. And when you are a true believer, that is where you find pleasure, is in serving Him. So you have to be willing to turn from your sins and you have to be willing to cast your whole hope of heaven on Jesus Christ and on Him alone. And if you are willing to do that, which the Bible again tells us, you, if God's Spirit is working in your heart, you will be willing. If you're willing to do that, if you're willing to come to Jesus Christ, He will forgive you of all of your sins. And He will hold on to you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. He'll never cast you away, but He will keep you. This example of Peter's fall shows us that even the greatest sins that a Christian can commit will be forgiven by our Lord and every believer will turn by
by God's grace back to him, he was restored to encourage you that there is mercy, there is grace. That's what the gospel is all about. You just need to turn from your sins and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you do, he will save you and he will make sure that you stay saved. Well, that is very gracious in light of the fact of what we are. So we do need to thank the Lord for that mercy. Well, let's, uh, let's bow for a moment of prayer. And let's ask that the Lord would help us again to apply what we've heard. If you haven't come to Christ, pray that the Lord would give you the grace to come to him and trust in him and receive that mercy. And if you are a believer and you're struggling with assurance, will God forgive me for this sin or that particular sin? Realize that if you turn from it to Jesus, he will cleanse you of all sin, every sin. Well, let's, let's bow for a few moments of prayer.